Was muted. Just making sure you guys were paying attention. No other God can be called a father. No other God can be called a friend. No other God can be called a God's coming back again and how we love your name Jesus you're the beautiful one we love your name and how we love your name Jesus you're the beautiful one
They say this mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the tide will never change They haven't seen what
So we're in the sermon series, Kingdom Builder, um, and that's partnering with our app that we're going to be coming out with um, in building God's kingdom. We need to, we're at this church, we're about, a, we're about win, train, send, win people to Christ, train them up in the word and send them out to do their own ministry. Um, it's all about building God's kingdom and this whole sermon series over being a kingdom builder. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, some other good news that I want to talk about. Uh, Really funny, I just found out uh, maybe two weeks ago that I'm gonna be a boy dad instead of just a girl dad now. So we're having a boy, super excited, super excited. And I wanna kind of bring you guys in on how my wife told me that she was pregnant. So um, these stories always end really, really, really cheesy and great, but this one started just like every other maybe little marriage quarrel on a Saturday afternoon for a guy that likes to golf. So I go golfing on a Saturday afternoon. My wife and I do not communicate at all what golf course I'm going to be at. And if you're golfing in Lincoln, you could be clear far south. You could be an eagle. You could be somewhere else. It takes a while to get places. Well, my wife and I were wanting to come together and meet at Walmart when I was done golfing and then go home and do some shopping and then go home. Well, she didn't anticipate me be cl being clear out by Eagle because I usually golf a little bit closer to Walmart. So she left from her parents' house and I am like 45 minutes from Walmart. She's sitting in the parking lot waiting for me. She's frustrated. She's not gonna wait another 20 minutes. Little did I know that my wife was picking up a pregnancy test at Walmart. Um, we had been trying for a little over a year um, to no uh, positive tests and uh, so I get home, she's like, well, fine, I'm just gonna go in and get whatever I got and I'll meet you at home. Well, she beats me home and I get on my truck and my daughter runs up to me with a little plastic thing in her hand. And it said that my wife was pregnant and I couldn't, and of course, <clears throat> I held it together. I cried a normal amount that a dad would cry. I didn't cry any more than that. So um, cried a little bit and then immediately, my knee-jerk reaction was, who can I tell? <laughs> Honey, tell me who I've got permission to tell, please. I want to tell everybody, but just tell me who I can tell right now. And we agreed um, that in the first that we just tell our parents and then our siblings. Well, my wife went into the bathroom. I immediately plugged my phone in the charger and called my mom immediately and was like, mom, we're pregnant again. You know, the, the elation starts. And my wife's like, oh my goodness, you can't stop for five seconds. It's like, no, when it's good news, I can't help but share it. And we're all this way. When we get exciting news in our lives, all we wanna do is share it. Trust me, I've, I have Facebook, I've seen Facebook. When even the littlest good thing happens in our lives, we wanna make it a celebration, which is good, which is good. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but there's good news that we have in our life that we refuse to share at times that sometimes we may be ashamed to share because we feel like we're maybe the only one that thinks this news is good. And that's the news of Jesus being sent, born, dying for us so that we may live in eternity. The best news. And if we're not sharing the good news, then we're not building God's kingdom. And what's the opposite of building God's kingdom is building our own. So when we post on Facebook and we're talking about our own lives and how it's great it's going and we're not giving any glory to God and we're not sharing that he saved us from ourselves, then we're building our own kingdom. We're not building God's kingdom. We're not sharing the greatest news of all. We're not sharing news that can literally save people's lives. If you're a note taker and you wanna follow along today, we're gonna be going through a section of scripture, uh, Romans chapter one, verses one through 17, I promise I'll go fast. Um, so sharing the news is a big deal. Sharing the good news is a big deal. It's the only way we're going to be kingdom builders. Sharing the news makes us, makes us want to do other things. Because when you share Christ with people, they're gonna have questions and you wanna have answers for those questions. So it's gonna make you get into the word. When you share Christ with people and you invite them to church, 
you better be there when they show up. So it's gonna make you want to go to church. When you share Christ with people and you talk about even a further step of going to church and being part of a Bible study and breaking down and knowing who God is, you'll go to a Bible study. You'll serve his kingdom. You'll wanna show people through your actions, through your actions, that your faith is justified. I chose God, so therefore I'm going to act this way because this is the way God wants me to act. And the one thing he tells you to do is to share his word. So we're in Romans. Uh, let's read through the first seven verses and then we'll do a little breakdown. Uh, written by Paul, uh, probably the most famous New Testament characters outside of Jesus, a far, far number two, Jesus being number one. Um, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle set apart from the gospel, set apart for the gospel of God which he promises beforehand through his prophets in, holy, in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who is a descendant from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we receive grace and apostleship, bring about the obedience and faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including to you who are called to belong to Christ, to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm sure so, most of us in the room have heard gospel, has heard, have you heard the good news? And maybe somebody's knocked on your door with a black tie and a white shirt and a strap over their shoulder and said, have you heard the good news? Have you heard the good news? Gospel literally is translated, translated to as good news in the Hebrew. In the original, sorry, in the Greek, not the Hebrew. In the original Greek, it's translated as good news. In the Anglo-Saxon uh, language, which the English version of gospel actually is from God's spell, which means good story. So the gospel, the good news has been promised from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I think it's very, very, very important when speaking about New Testament and when speaking about the Lord and the gospel and the good news that you include Old Testament reference. Because all the Old Testament is, is an anticipation of the Savior. As soon as Adam and Eve took of the apple, God knew that there was going to need to be a sacrifice and it was going to be his son. He knew from the beginning that we were going to need to be saved. So there was going to be a gospel starting in uh, Genesis chapter one in the fall. The easiest way to see this even in this book of Rome, in the book of Romans right here, chapter one, uh, verse one, chapter one, verse two, which he had promised before the gospel which he had promised before through the prophets of the Holy Scriptures. It's important that we don't look at the Bible as Old Testament and then New Testament. And the New Testament is not a spinoff. It's not a different version. It's a continuation of the Old Testament. And the easiest way, I heard one guy break it down this way and I hold on to it for the rest of my life. It's the easiest way to, to chunk the Bible. It's called Ampec. A-M-P-E-C, Ampec. Anticipation, that'd be Genesis through Malachi. So all the Old Testament is an anticipation for the good news, for the Savior that's coming. Manifestation, so Jesus' life being born. The story we're gonna be hearing all month about Jesus being born, we're in the Christmas season. So that'd be the manifestation, the gospels are the manifestation of Jesus living his life here on earth, dying for us and, and raising again. The proclamation so the, the spreading of the beginning of God's church, Church of Jesus Christ, would be in the book of Acts. You would explain how to be a Christian and how to follow Jesus in Romans through Jude. That'd be the explanation. And the consummation, the second coming of Christ would be in Revelation. So it's a way to break the book down and make it all connect because it all has one purpose. The entire Bible has one purpose and the whole Bible is the good news. All of it not just part of it, not just Romans chapter one, verses one through 17, all of it, all of it God wants us to hear. All that has to do with his son coming, us being saved, and then how God wants to live, want us to live our lives after we are saved. 
you can't read the Old Testament without missing the anticipation that someone is coming. Do they know who? No. Obviously, because the Jews missed that point when Jesus came the first time. And something is coming. In 330 plus prophecies, so there's 330 Old Testament prophecies um, that were fulfilled over 330 prophecies written over 1,600 years, fulfilled through one person. One person. 330 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by one person, that's Jesus Christ. The first nine, just the story that we're gonna celebrate this, uh, this winter season, Jesus' birth, the first nine prophecies prophesied in the Old Testament, the same probability of one person fulfilling the first nine, so who his, who his mom was, who his dad was, where he was born, how he would be treated when he was born, who would come visit him when he was born. The first nine prophecies of his birth and him fulfilling those prophecies would be the same as if you stack Texas up over a mile high with quarters, marked one with an X, jumped in and picked it up on your first try. That's just the first nine, that's just the birth. That's not the life, the teaching, the baptism, where he, would, where he would die, where he would be buried, all anticipated in the Old Testament. So we can't completely dismiss that when we're talking about the gospel because the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the New Testament. <clears throat> Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 40, all these, though condemned through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And this is just referring to the prophets of the Old Testament. They didn't have God. They were commended through their faith. They didn't have Jesus Christ. They didn't have the physical manifestation of the Savior, but still were willing to give their lives. They were, they were condemned. They were commended through their faith. But they didn't have the Savior. He hadn't come yet. But they knew he was coming. They've always known he was coming. First Peter 1, 10 through 12, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And the things they have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent to them from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Affirming that the things that they were teaching back then is what we, what they were experiencing now in Peter. What they're experiencing now has already been foretold. And they refer to it as the holy scripture of the past. They don't refer to it as the old book. They don't refer to it as something else. It's all part of the good news. And when the New Testament dawns after the 400 years of silence, an angel appears to some shepherds near Bethlehem and announces, behold, I bring to you good news of great joy, which shall be, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day this, in the city of David, a savior, who is Christ the Lord. That's Luke 2, 10 through 11. Good news indeed, the Savior has arrived. The one who's, who was anticipated since the day of Adam and Eve is now on the scene to soon provide eternal salvation. Sharing the good news requires a faith-filled and excitement and singular focus. And that's the next chunk of scriptures. We're gonna be going through eight through 15 at this point. So Romans eight, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. So let's just back up a little bit. Paul's writing to the Romans. He's never been to Rome. He's never met any of these people personally, but he is absolutely fired up that in the center of the world at the time, Roman empire, we know him as one of the greatest empires, at the time that there was people preaching the word of Jesus in Rome, a place where he hasn't even been yet, excites him, gets him fired up. He's excited that people are selling out for Jesus Christ. When you're sharing the gospel, you've gotta be excited when people sell out for Christ. We see it all the time. 
And it's a, it's a blessing to say that we're used to seeing this, what we saw today. Seeing someone sell out for Christ and be baptized, giving his life to Jesus. I believe he believed in his heart, he spoke his mouth and he showed you physically today. That should excite us. That there should be nothing more fulfilling. The angels literally party in heaven every time somebody's baptized and accepts Christ into their life. It should be exciting, the most exciting thing. For God is my witness, who I'm ser- whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I mention you. So once again, a re- reference to praying without ceasing, he mentions these people to Christ all the time, even though he's never met them. Paul's showing us by example, pray for people you don't even know. Pray for everybody who's fighting for Christ. Pray for all of your brothers and sisters, whether you know them by name or not. Always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to, to strengthen you, That is what we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. We we talk about Hebrews 10, 24 in this church. Don't stop meeting together. The world told us for a year and a half to almost two years, don't go to church. Don't go to church. Paul's reiterating, because the Bible repeats itself all the time, that I can't wait to be around you so we can encourage one another to continue doing what they're doing, which is spreading the good news. 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. In order that I may reap some harvest among, among you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So even in his trip, Rome, probably beautiful. The, I mean, awesome architecture. Some of it's still standing today. Some of us still want to go see ancient Rome to this to the, to this day, so sorry. We still want to go see it. It's still beautiful. And all Paul wants to do when he goes there is not to be distracted by the, by the glam of Rome, but he wants to go there, make disciples. He wants to go there and have a bountiful harvest. He wants to, he wants to have fruit. He wants to bear fruit when he goes to Rome. He doesn't want to go and just sightsee. He, he does go sightsee. He sightsees the inside of a jail as soon as he gets there. Why? Because he has a singular focus and he's overly excited about going and sharing Christ wherever he goes, including the Romans, letting them know before he comes, hey boys, I'm coming to teach the word. I'm coming to encourage you. I hope I learn just as much from you as you learn from me. Obvious uh, uh, position of humility and being humbled by the spirit. I'm under obligation to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. This one really hit home with me. Um, 14 really stirred my spirit. I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both the wise and the foolish. People I get along with, people I don't get along with, the smart people in my life, the dumb people in my life, doesn't matter. I'm indebted to them because I now have a gift that needs to be shared. I'm indebted to them because I have a gift that I wasn't able to pay for that all my God asked me to do is share. If we think back to when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, he asked the blinding light, literally knocked off his donkey. He asked the light two questions. One, Lord, who are you? because he knew he was a servant to whatever this being was that knocked him off his horse, knocked him off his donkey, blinded him, and is now speaking to him. And he knew, he felt the power. And the second question is, is the question we should all ask ourselves when we accept Christ, we should ask Christ, is what do you want me to do? And God says, go and make disciples. Go and spread my word. Jesus himself speaks to Paul and says, go and spread my word. I ask you to do nothing else. Singular focus and excitement on spreading God's word. Some of your guys' stories may be a lot like that. It might not have been actual light that knocked you off, but something knocked you off your high horse 
and you ask yourself two questions. God, what do I, God, if you are there, what do I do? And that might've led you to a church, but that might've led you to ask somebody in your life a question. Be that person that invites somebody to church or answers that question. 15, so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Romans 1.8, I want to highlight some things. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all you that faith is spoken throughout the whole world. We stopped on this for a second. But Rome was a place where you could easily find yourself in the darkness. Just like in our culture today, you can easily find yourself in, in, a, in a bad situation. Rome was no different. Rome was no different from a metropolis or, or anything like that excited. Romans 1, 14 through 15. I am a debtor to both Greeks and barbarians. It was the term used for non-Greeks, barbarians. So we had Jews, Gentiles, or Greeks, and then we had people below that. And Paul even said that he's indebted to them too. And Paul's not a guy who was indebted to anybody according to the world. Paul was one of the smartest men from the, one of the most prestigious universities. And sometimes we like to think of this hero, Paul, as this tall, dark, and handsome glass of water. I read a, a, a description of who Paul was, Paul of Sicily. So Saul actually means, his, his Roman name Paul actually means short small. So Paul goes by his Roman name on his conversion, and it means small. So Paul was not like a six foot five looking, good looking guy either. He said, Paul means small. He's described as a pale man whose eyebrows touched in the middle, and his nose had a hook to it. So I know sometimes you probably picture Paul as this big, striking, handsome guy. Think more or less Arnold Schwarzenegger and like Danny DeVito. Or like a Jerry Nadler. We're talking like that's what Paul looked like, okay? He wasn't this big, uh, gorgeous man. Uh, and he, he was indebted to no one. He was smart. He had money. He knew everything when it came to, they memorized the first five books of the Bible. Every boy did that from, from an established home. Memorized to full the first five books of the Bible. And he was one of the best at that. Some of us can't even remember what we have for lunch. Both to the wise and the unwise, so that, so that as much as is, my, as is in mine, I am ready to preach the gospel to those who are in Rome. Singular focus. I'm in Rome to do one thing, and that's preach the gospel to whoever's got ears, whoever wants to hear it. There's nothing bad about this good news. The only bad thing is people haven't figured out that they're living the bad news. We become ashamed, and this is where I'm going to get into Romans 16 and 17. We need to be unashamedly blessed to bless people. I'll break that down for you. Not ashamed that Christ saved me, and that I am blessed, and the only reason I am blessed is so that I can pass that blessing on. That's it. Once I've been one and I'm training up in God, I'm, I'm being sent out by this church to go win more people to Christ. My mission's never over. To build God's kingdom, you have to spread the word. You have to tell the good news. Romans 1, 16 through 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God, for is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from the faith, from faith for faith, that is written, that as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I am not ashamed of the gospel. I don't know if you guys heard of uh, Lecrae, but he started a group called the 116, and it was a direct reference to Romans 116. And it's, I am not ashamed of the gospel. In, in, in Timothy, it tells us uh, uh, we are given a spirit of power, not of fear, but of power, and not to be ashamed. Because when you become ashamed of the person that saved you, 
you're not gonna talk about them. The things that we're ashamed of in our lives, we keep a secret. We keep hidden under a rug, under a bush. And why do we become ashamed? Because we give in to the one lie that the devil has to set. For all of us, it's the same, it's cookie cutter. It's to make you think that you're alone, period. To make you think that you're the only one in this fight. Why do you think the world, Satan, doesn't want you to come to church? Because he doesn't want you to be encouraged. He doesn't want you to know that there's also people in this fight with you. Know that when you share the gospel, even if you're in a room by yourself with you only, you're the only believer, think about these, these prophets of the Old Testament. They were few and far between. And they took on some bad people that did some Satan worship, like cutting themselves open, willing to kill people that believed in Jesus and believed in Christ that a savior was coming. Don't be ashamed of what you've been saved from. I think that's why some people don't, some people don't respond well when you tell them you're a Christian because um, it's kind of like entering a rap battle and it's the end of a movie. It's like you enter a rap battle and you just diss yourself the whole time and then they've got nothing to come back at you with. Because if you're a Christian, what you're saying is, I believe in Rome, in the book of Romans where it tells me everybody's fallen short of the glory of God. And I'm not ashamed because I'm saved by the one person that has the ability to do that. I can try to hide my imperfections from the world and destroy myself and, and, and separate myself from the world and everyone around me and become alone and fall into that trap. Or I can go out and share. I can go out and go to church and be encouraged. I can go worship. I can build God's kingdom. Because when you're doing that, you're not alone. When you're building your kingdom, you are alone. Because you're the only one that really cares about your own kingdom. God just wants you to build his. Go out and share that good news. And you don't have to be perfect either. I'll leave with a story here. There was a king and his city was under siege. It was during a war. And when you're under a siege, you get no food, no water. You're cut off from, from all trade. So the people are starving inside this king's walls. And the, ones, and the story goes that there was two women arguing below the, the feet of the king. And they said, hey, we, we ate my son the night before and she promised that it'd be her son tonight and now she's not doing it. And the king rips his cloak. He's like, not even God could save us. We're starving, we're getting bombed. People are eating each other. And there was three lepers outside of the gate. And if you know anything about a leper is that they're casted out immediately because they're sick, because they don't fit in with the rest of them. People are scared of them. So they cast the lepers outside the gate and they're just like, dude, you know what? Everybody's starving in there. Let's just go join the other team. Let's go. So they're all right, fine. They start walking and they crack a stick. And one of the scouts hears it. And he gets really scared because he thinks it's the enemy army coming. So he gets up and he jumps and he makes a big rustle. Well, the army behind him thinks it's multiple men coming at him, so they turn and run. And then when that stampede starts running back to camp, everybody thinks they're being stormed by the other army. So the whole army takes off. So these guys, these lepers literally walk into an empty camp. They're like, guys, where are we here? What? There's food everywhere. They've cut off the trade line. They're eating and they're filling their bellies and they're so full. And they were probably kicked out before the food even ran out. They've probably been starving for scraps for a long time being lepers. And they look back at the city. One guy does. As he rolls out of the tent full of food, looks back at the city and he looks back at his friends and he goes, let's share this. Let's share this. The people that have been casted out by their own people look back and they save the city. They bring them the gift. They didn't deserve it. They didn't work for it. They walked and scared a couple guys and they ran off. They could have kept it for themselves. Be like, oh, they kicked us out. They hated us. So we're never going to give it to them. We can't have that mindset. The gift of Christ dying on the cross was for everyone. He tells us that even in the Old Testament, when God starts talking to Abraham, I want you to bless all nations, not just your people. So let's remember that as we go to communion, like we do every week here. If you've asked Christ to be a part of your life and you've been baptized and you've done all those steps, then you're more than welcome to have communion with us today. 
but I want you to remember as we have communion that it's Christ's body broken for you, a gift that we didn't deserve that we need to share. And I wanted you to think of a few people that need to hear the good news that is Jesus. And this time of year when we're talking about his birth is the best time of all to remind people why we get gifts, why we're celebrating, why lights are up. Because it's the best news we've ever gotten was that Jesus was born. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your sacrifice to us. We thank you for your power in creating this earth and giving us the freedom to choose you or the world. And Lord, I just pray for the people in this room, the ones that have chosen you, that they keep spreading that word. And Lord, for the ones that are on the fence and they don't know, Lord, I just pray they get in your word and they get to know you and, and they respond to you asking, go and make disciples, believe in me. Let me save you. Lord, you are awesome. And we thank you for the opportunity to see the fruit that is life change. And we thank you for a country where we can come to church and worship you freely. Thank you for that. We love you, Lord. Amen. They say this mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no
said it, Lord. God, we believe. You said it. God, we believe for it. You said it. I believe it. You said it. So it is done. It's as good as done. You said it. Would you say that to him with me? I believe.